Well, thanks. Thanks, Dave, for having me and uh, I'm addicts for another outstanding program, uh, Packing the House. Uh, it was great uh, to see everybody and all the questions from this morning and fantastic presentations. So I have been asked to tell you, well, what, what's next? And the things I'm going to talk to you mostly about are things that are realistically next um, rather than theoretically next. Uh, please just presume that any uh, agent that I am speaking about we either serve on the Data and Safety Monitoring Board or consultant for, we do the clinical trials or all the above. So uh, the previous speakers talked about anti-adhesion molecule uh, antibodies, um, natalizumab, vetalizumab. Uh, and one uh, that, and you can see that they're both approved for Crohn's disease and vetalizumab is approved also for ulcerative colitis. Uh, an investigational one that's getting a lot of interest is called etralizumab. And, uh, the reason that these are uh, uh, very safe molecules and specific is because they are targeting certain types of adhesion molecules that may be unique to different parts of the body. And uh, the etralizumab, as you see at the very bottom of the slide, binds to alpha-4 beta-7, which uh, vetalizumab uh, binds to, but also alpha-E beta-7. Natalizumab binds alpha-4, so it'll do alpha-4 beta-1, alpha-4 beta-7, and, and vetalizumab is alpha-4 beta-7. That's why it's gut only. But etralizumab binds a new one, alpha-E beta-7 too, which is thought to be important in trafficking and retention of lymphocyte uh, and leukocyte subsets in the intestinal uh, mucosa. And currently it is investigational. It's at once a month or every four-week injections, and that uh, is enrolling. Uh, you know, just as a quick aside, there are all of a sudden a lot of very interesting therapies for Crohn's and colitis that are enrolling in clinical trials. And believe it or not, most of the patients that we see at the University of Chicago are, don't qualify. They're too sick. They've already been on other things or on too many things. So the time to get patients into clinical trials is before you start the next agent. And in ways, before you do the next scope, because now almost all the trials will include a scope, which is free, trial pays for it, for your patients. So think about wherever you may be living, wherever you may refer to clinical trials, because as you'll see, a lot of these agents um, have a lot of promise. So that was the anti-adhesion molecule. There are others being studied, but, but this one I think was the most notable. Now, the second approach, and this is something that is going to come uh, uh, to fruition sooner than you might think, are anti-IL-12 and or anti-IL-23 antibodies, so interleukin blockers for 12 and 23. The reason why is because there's already one on the market called ustekinumab that's used for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And this agent will hopefully be approved for Crohn's disease within the next two months. Ustekinumab, if you look at this slide, is an antibody, so it's an injectable monoclonal antibody. The antibody blocks the P40 subunit, which happens to be seen on interleukin-12 and interleukin-23. And this then prevents, uh, as you can see, the stimulation of the CD4 positive cells and production of IL-17 and gamma interferon and other, uh, uh, other interleukins and immune processes. As I mentioned, the drug is already on the market for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And their dosing, and which is based on weight, and after an initial load given every three months. So many of us are already using this off-label uh, in Crohn's disease. Usually we have to stick with the dosing that's listed there, although there may be some exceptions. This is the Crohn's data, the phase three. Notice the green bar. This hopefully will be what the approval is. The way this is most likely going to work is there's going to be an initial IV infusion of roughly six milligrams per kilogram, and you can see this is one dose, so by week, week six to eight, you have over half the patients responding with one IV dose. Remission rates, the green bar, about one-third, up to 40% by week eight with a single dose. If the dosing is how we anticipate, this will then be followed by a subcutaneous dose every eight weeks. Here is the data in the green bar. This is what we anticipate for the maintenance. You can see it basically uh, almost a year out, about half the patients in the green bar uh, 
are um, in, in 53% in remission, almost 50% off steroids in remission, and 60% responding. So uh, we believe pretty soon you'll be able to give a single IV dose followed by every eight week uh, subcutaneous 90 milligram dose. The 90 milligram is currently available uh, in psoriasis for patients 100 kilograms or more. Um, we, uh, actually, I've been very successful in just prescribing that dose for the Crohn's patients. Now I'm hoping to uh, be able to get the IV dose soon. What about safety? Well, there are no black box warnings right now. You do have to test for TB prior, and then just like many of the other agents, as you can see, and this is straight from the label, there are theoretical risks of other um, opportunistic infections and may increase the risk of malignancy, and um, there are some can, people can be anaphylaxis, but right now the safety is very, very promising. We really haven't been aware of any major issues with ustekinumab, and it's been on the market for a number of years, as I mentioned, for the other indications. I already told you, and hopefully we'll find out within the next two months. So that, so that blocks IL-12 and 23. There is some thoughts that selective IL-23 inhibitors in psoriasis may even be more effective or as effective, and we've been looking at those uh, in Crohn's disease. This is a phase two trial that was presented at DDW in patients with moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Um, I'll point out to you uh, the week 12 outcomes. So it's three months out. The remission, if you look at the highest dose, the, the green, the 600 milligrams, 36%, response 42%, endoscopic remission, when you stick a scope in, you're almost 20% uh, remission, uh, and then deep remission, meaning clinically and endoscopically, 12%. Now you say, well, that's not that high, but none of the patients who got placebo um, were in a deep remission. So this is nice because also, so far, the safety has been uh, not an issue. Uh, for a selective IL-23 inhibitor, and there's another selective IL-23 inhibitor that we're studying. All these um, are in clinical trials uh, and uh, enrolling. Another family is the anti-IL-6 antibodies. So an anti-IL-6 antibodies are available right now for rheumatoid arthritis. Tocilizumab is the drug. Uh, this uh, antibody you can see in red in the cartoon um, binds uh, to uh, the receptor and prevents signal transduction and gene expression. So it binds both the soluble and the mem membrane-bound uh, membrane receptor. And notice how it works. It activates the JAK1 STAT3 pathway. We're going to talk about that in a minute. It's approved for rheumatoid arthritis uh, and juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Uh, the dosing uh, is based on body weight. This is data now from Crohn's disease. Patients got infusions every two weeks for 12 weeks. They either got placebo, which is black, they had the, the drug alternating with placebo, which is red, or they got just the drug, which is green. And you can see the response rates were nice, 80% response, which is quite remarkable, although the remission rates were only about 20% and did not statistically beat placebo. So the data has been a little mixed in Crohn's disease with the IL-6 uh, tocilizumab. Um, safety. Uh, there were a few things GI-specific that showed up in the trial, GI bleed, which you can see, um, that was actually the person who's getting some placebo, paralytic ileus, but probably um, more important for the GI world, and there was just another uh, update on this, is, if I'm look, looking further down, uh, GI perforations. So uh, now the GI perforations in the studies included things like perianal fistula, which we would see in Crohn's disease. We're not that impressed by that, but there are concerns um, about other types of perforations, diverticulitis or perforation and things too. So the, the GI perforation term keeps on popping up in, in, with tocilizumab or with the investigational IL-6 inhibitors. So the role in um, Crohn's disease or colitis may be less clear. I do have patients who are on this through the rheumatologist um, uh, and uh, for the rheumatoid arthritis, who also have uh, ulcerative colitis, and actually have found it works quite well, but there are some patients um, where it may not work well. So it is on the market, it's a possibility. I mentioned to you the oral uh, JAK inhibitors. So one of the keys is the first word, oral. Okay, so there are uh, 
small molecules uh, that are, are on the market now for other conditions that we may be seeing for our patients. Tofacitinib is on the market for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it inhibits the JAK1, uh, 2N3, uh, resulting in the suppression of phosphostat pathway. You can, for those of you who are going to, you know, maybe make this cocktail up tonight, and uh, suppresses a lot of different inflammatory cytokines. Now, look what I wrote in red. And you see the highest dose is effective. And in Crohn's, we had negative phase two. But one of the problems that they've been having is very, very high placebo rates, nearly 50% in the Crohn's trials. And how, do you, how can you tell a drug works if the placebo rate uh, is nearly 50%? You have to beat placebo, obviously, by a certain amount to, to move forward. Um, safety has been the same as with placebo. Uh, no difference at all. There are slight increases in cholesterol, LDL, and HDL, which are reversible. But it really, it's only a few percentage increases. It's not that big a deal. So here is the DDW presentation for ulcerative colitis. I'm going to point out that the current dosing for rheumatoid arthritis is 5 milligrams twice a day, although uh, in the UC trials, um, it is 10 milligrams twice a day. Remission rates at week 8, so just two months out, you have almost 20% in remission, a third of them healing the mucosa, and response rates 60%. So we're very excited um, by this data. Uh, as I mentioned, one of the reasons why we're excited is because placebo rates, instead of being 50%, were 30%. <laughs> um, I'm uh, someone who doesn't uh, think that just because the study didn't beat placebo in Crohn's that we should give up on the drug because the placebo rate was so high. We'll see what happens with that. Now, as I mentioned, this blocks... Um, uh, this oral agent that blocks the J and K kinase pathways. There are different ones. One of the um, key uh, presentations at DDW uh, was about a different, a competitor, an oral JAK1 selective inhibitor. So this only blocks the um, JAK1, not 1, 2, and 3, which may have some benefits compared to a, uh, a JAK1, 2, and 3 inhibitor. And this was the data shown at DDW by Severin Vermeer. It's called the Fitzroy study, for those of you who are taking notes. And this is week 10 outcomes. You can see remission rates nearly 50%, response rates nearly 60%. So again, this is very exciting, oral agent. Many of our patients for many years now, since we've had such great res re responses with uh, the anti-TNFs and, and with the anti-adhesion molecules, they're all IV or injectables. They've been asking us, well, are there any oral agents that are coming down the pipeline? The answer is yes, there are ones on the market, as I mentioned, and another one, uh, another few are, <laughs> are, in, uh, are, are in testing. There are some other agents that I want to point out. Uh, Apremolast is on the market for uh, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, sorry. It was approved in 2014. It's a small molecule. It's a pill. It inhibits phosphodiesterase 4, which downregulates TNF and a bunch of interleukins and prevents recruitment of the white blood cells. Um, there is a placebo-controlled trial currently enrolling. Uh, I encourage you, again, if you have patients who have ulcerative colitis who want to try something different, this is an oral agent. Uh, we'd love to get them uh, enrolled into uh, this trial. Some patients, when they first start a medicine, get a little diarrhea, but it, um, it, we ramp up the dose, and it's usually self-limited. Another agent, which I get lots of calls about um, from investment people, that's, that's actually how you know when something's promising. You find out first from the investment, right? <laughs> Supposedly, there's no, there's no more insider trading, right? Um, but literally, even if you're an investigator on a trial, you find out when the results when you get a, right when you get a call from Bloomberg News or one of the others too. You know there must be something up. Um, so azonamod, uh, this class of drugs has been showing success in multiple sclerosis, uh, and this agent actually, um, if you read down the slides, it blocks the white cells from being released from the lymph nodes and it interferes with trafficking in the gut. And, the, and the, the classic model for ulcerative colitis is an interleukin-10 knockout mouse model, and it works very well in this. 
and the safety also is quite good. Here is data that was last year at DDW. They had nearly 200 patients with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis, and um, they were dosed daily, uh, oral agent, and you can see in the green, the one milligram dose, ha over half the patients responded, and the mucosal improvement over a third of patients. Uh, so this actually looks very promising, and there was an update um, further at DDW this year to showing um, histological benefits. So even under the microscope, they actually showed um, very promising histological result, re results. So remember, if you're looking at ulcerative colitis, it's a mucosal disease, right? The disease is at the mucosa. We're gastroenterologists. We can get to the mucosa. So if it looks good to you, and then you take biopsies, and the inflammation is gone or nearly gone, and you're at the mucosal level, it's very, very encouraging, um, particularly in ulcerative colitis. There are many other uh, agents that, for the sake of time, I'm just going to list here. I don't, I'm not listing them all in case there is anybody from industry who's mad. You didn't list my, my agent. Um, the top one blocks um, was MADCAM1, which is one of the ways that some of the adhesion molecules work. But look what I wrote. The placebo response rate was, again, nearly 50%. So we're trying to change that in our Crohn's trials because now the patients get colonoscopies and they're read by a central reader. That means it's videoed. And even though you may think something looks inflamed, the central reader uh, has to go through and, and show it looks inflamed. So typically, the placebo response rate goes way down. There's eldelumab, which I thought was like a berry, which is an anti-IP10 antibody, uh, another uh, approach, which also had some promising results. I already showed you the IL-23 data. And another uh, very interesting product that we're currently testing is an anti-matrix metalloproteinase 9 antibody. Um, and that is another one where we're getting a lot of interest from the investment crowd as well, too. Uh, I mentioned small molecules. Again, so small molecules are pills. Uh, tofacitinib, which I showed you the data for, is approved for rheumatoid arthritis. Apremolas is approved for psoriasis. Mongresin is not approved. It was an interesting drug that Italian studies uh, had very high response and remission rates, published in New England Journal of Medicine. We're going to see if this data um, is replicated outside of Italy. Oh, Azanamon I just mentioned, and there, and there are many others. So the exciting thing is, is that compared to <laughs> just a few years ago, we now are going to have many options. Some of them are already on the market, and we actually sometimes can get for our patients with, uh, with letters to insurance if they failed other things. But uh, I, I think, as you saw from the first presentations today, um, with appropriate use of the medications we do have, we have a lot of very promising things to offer our patients. And with that, my daughters and I would like to thank you for your attention.